So speaking of well child tamariki ora um, and practitioners who have been involved with that, I'd like to um, welcome uh, Dr. Johan Moreau. Johan is a paediatrician who has until recently been one of the uh, senior paediatricians in Rotorua. He uh, retired just under a year ago from active clinical practice, but is still heavily involved in a range of policy and other uh, era, uh, uh, processes within the District Health Board. He's the, uh, one of the co-authors of the original Tamariki Ora document, which uh, formed the background for a range of well-child uh, developments in New Zealand. Johan was the Chief Medical Officer for Lakes District, District Health Board for 11 years and has held a number of senior medical leadership and roles, including the Chairman of the Child Health Division, NZ President of the College, he's the Trustee of the Brainwave Trust, and the experience he's, uh, he's had has enabled him to understand and, what's more, uh, communicate the direct linkage between government policy structures, culture and focus of the services being delivered and the relationship to what is happening in New Zealand for children and young people. His first 1000 Days TED Talk, uh, which is uh, available as a link on the app, gives emphasis to this and reflects his uh, ongoing interest in Māori child health. So, Johan, welcome and I look forward to your address. Tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou, tēnā koutou katoa. Nga mihi atu a hau, ki ora koutou. Um, thanks very much, Pat, for the introduction, and uh, to Pat and Mark particularly for, uh, for putting investment in children onto the RACP agenda. Um, clearly a recognition of the, uh, the critical nature of this in determining the well-being of a person for the rest of their lives. And uh, I think Richie's given us a really good... Uh, head start in terms of, uh, of, of kicking, out, kicking off just why this is so important. And I hope you'll uh, enjoy this talk and, uh, and that afterwards, uh, particularly the adult physicians, I suspect the paediatricians uh, know most of this, uh, will uh, we'll, we'll take something away that, uh, that increases their own level of, uh, of interest and understanding in the subject. I'm just gonna get this thing working. Wouldn't it be great if, uh, if every child looked like this? That potential to be aspiring, to, as they grow older, to self-determine their lives and leave, and ultimately leave a legacy. And wouldn't it be great if a whakatauki like this applied to every child? A hakoa heiti, heiti punamu. Although she's small, she's precious. But, New Zealand's now had poverty for a long time, child poverty. It's reached a stage where this is now intergenerational. So where we were running child poverty figures of around 5 to 10% in the late 80s, these escalated at that time with the loss of the family benefit and uh, privatisation of forests and railways, increased to around 25 to 30%, and apart from a slight drop with working for families that uh, has stayed at that level ever since. So that's been a disaster for inequity uh, and it's damaged parenting. And, I, and I'm absolutely certain that it reflects the inc or results in the increased issues that we're now seeing with, uh, with our problems with mental health and behavioral issues in children. Let's go back to this slide and uh, and reflect on the importance of a pure pregnancy. This is the notion of this being a planned, wanted child, where the parents get to dream and attach to their baby during the pregnancy, where there's good nutrition, no alcohol, drugs or cigarettes, and where antenatal care is needed, it occurs. You can't talk about the subject without reflecting on neuroscience, the whole science around the development of the infant's brain about attachment and a process that's facilitated by oxytocin. I'll talk a little bit more about that. This, this is a picture of one of my sons with his little niece uh, meeting her for the first time. He didn't know what to do. And I said, look, just hold her like this, one hand under the head, one hand under the bottom, and just start talking to her. 
And within a really short time, he was interacting beautifully. You could see them really starting to enjoy each other. They were almost certainly getting that flush of oxytocin, that social neuropeptide that makes you feel good about somebody and, uh, and that leads to attachment, to protection and, uh, and so on. So just a lovely thing to watch and actually he was singing with her um, by the end of the session. And uh, yeah, so it is that early experience that builds a brain, this to and froing of interaction between people. You know, that notion of love is what grows an infant's brain. So the genes are the blueprint, but it's that experience that's the carpenter. And together, they build the brain from the base up. It's a bit like building a house. So you start off and, uh, and you start to grow it, and if you do it really well, then you'll have a strong foundation, and if you don't, then you end up with a weak one. And unfortunately, if it is weak, then the lack of foundation for the development of those executive skills that Richie was talking about, the self-control, the self-management, actually become the issue. 90% of a brain is grown by the time the kid's five. And you can see the little purple uh, section on the slide, where, uh, which is your frontal lobe areas clearly accounting for a lot of that executive function, which tends to occur after the age of five. This slide shows the proliferation of neurons and neural pathways that's occurring in those first three years. Billions and billions and billions of these happening. And if you don't use those neurons, or if they're damaged by the toxic stressors that apply to so many of the people's lives that we deal with, then these get pruned back. And with a brain, it's really hard to get that back later. Uh, a mature brain doesn't grow neurons like, the, like it does early it's much less responsive to experience and, uh, and change. So the window of opportunity is when the child is young. And I think that literature of Richie's again bears that out. So development occurs when a child and somebody else interact, ideally somebody who's besotted with that kid and gives them the time that they need. And so through observing, through interacting, through playing, a child then develops abilities and in time their identity. You can't talk about this without talking about stress. So there's the positive stress, which is the sort of transient experience that gives a child the confidence to know that they can manage. And you know we've all had that. Then there's tolerable stress, which is where you, something major happens, the loss of a parent, the loss of a sibling, a house fire. But the child is wrapped under the umbrella of a family, a whānau that's supportive and helps to make it all work. And that becomes tolerable. But then there's toxic stress, which is the same scenario, but where there is none of the supports, where the child is on their own. And you know, another good example would be neglected, left in a, an orphanage or in a house, uh, unattended to, nobody responding, to the point where the child's then giving up. And in that situation, the stress levels are really, really high. They remain activated, the sympathomimetic system's turned on, cortisol's turned on, and, uh, and, and that carries on until the child eventually gives up. And when that happens, that toxic stress actually damages neural connections. This is all information that comes from the Center for the Developing Child in Harvard. And especially those areas that are damaged are those that are devoted to those higher order skills, that executive functioning, the functions like empathy, the ability to make judgments, the ability to control emotions, and the ability to learn. And that, as Richie again explained, leads to all sorts of issues around uh, behavior, physical health, mental health. And this, ex this is really just a, uh, a quick little example of, uh, of a damaged neuron and fewer connections that result from that toxic stress. So it's a serve and return type interaction. And what I was describing with my son and his little niece that actually is what grows the infant's brain. And, uh, and that back and forth, ideally, somebody you know, somebody that you relate to easily, is, is what works best. But it can also happen outside the home. And that's where you know, areas like early childhood centers and uh, schools can also make a difference. And we know that actually this is also one of the most important things you can do for a child that's been neglected, that's already been subject to a whole lot of stressors, that already has a, uh, a damaged brain, uh, that actually this is also part of the healing. 
And I suspect that a lot of the children and mental health issues that we deal with that are increasing in our communities currently are all kids with post-traumatic stress disorder that need a lot more of the serve and return in a trusted context. This slide is really just to make you remember that it is the serve and return that turn the lights on for a child and, uh, and really ignite the brain to, uh, to be doing what it needs to. Again, you can't have this conversation without reflecting on what happens when things go wrong. And I think of a pregnancy that's been compromised by smoking. Smoking reducing placental blood supply, therefore placental size, so the child doesn't grow so well, is more likely to become growth retarded, more likely to be born early. The fetus decides when it wants out earlier because things aren't so good inside. The pregnancy or the labour doesn't or the placenta doesn't stand the labour. And so there's more likely to be birth asphyxia, fetal distress, delivery by caesarean section, admission to a special care baby unit, separation from a family, separation from a mother, a child who's less likely to breastfeed, problems with attachment. Uh, you know, do we engage our fathers sufficiently in our newborn units? And the baby has smaller airways because of the smoking and gets sicker with their bronchiolitis and therefore more likely to end up on CPAP, more likely to end up ventilated. So real issues that arise from, the, from that, and obviously if you add to that the other factors that relate to addiction, uh, to poor nutrition, then things are even, uh, even going to be more of a problem. So these are the origins of vulnerability, and I've effectively discussed that slide already. For the adult physicians, David Barker was an ep epidemiologist in the uh, 70s and 80s in the UK, and he identified the relationship of a growth-retarded child to later metabolic syndrome. So the issues of, uh, of insulin resistance, of fatty metabolism problems, high blood pressures, and issues managing one's weight. And clearly this is the real challenge that is facing our system, which is going to be overwhelmed if we, uh, if we don't deal with it right, and if we don't get that healthy pregnancy uh, into our system. Another subject which also at least partially explains why it is so difficult for people to turn their lives around is the epigenome. The notion of environmental influences affecting whether and if genes are expressed or not. So the epigenome is like the software in a computer's operating system. And experiences before and soon after birth can result in the genes being modified, turned on or off, and determine whether they're expressed at all. So it's those injuries during pregnancy that we talked about. It's the toxic stress that we've talked about that determine chemical markers, epigenetic markers, that influence the architectural software of the developing brain. And the classic that I always think of is the gene for conduct disorder, which is expressed after exposure to emotional abuse and violence. But if you don't have exposure to it, it can remain unexpressed. That's quite a, a key thinking. Adverse childhood experiences, the ACEs, also explain a lot of the issues that we struggle with. So Kaiser Permanente in the US sent out questionnaires to 17,000 of their middle class people and asked whether they'd been subject to physical abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse, neglect, domestic violence, whether there was an incarcerated family member, mental illness, separation or divorce, a whole range of adverse childhood experiences, and the literature now adds poverty and racism to those. And what they did was they counted them, and they related them to the outcomes of a life for the people that they cared for. And what they found was really interesting, that there was inevitably uh, a much higher number of, uh, of ACEs leading to adverse outcomes. And so in this, this slide, basically demonstrates that uh, if you had four or more ACEs as a woman, 50% were likely to suffer from chronic depression, and men around 30%, and that's huge. Suicide attempts, 20% if you've got four or more ACEs. Again, that's huge and almost certainly relates to the high uh, youth suicide rates that we have in this country. 40% of the original sample reported two or more ACEs, a little under 25% three or more. 
12 and a half experienced four or more ACEs, and I suspect that that figure's higher in New Zealand. That leads to the suicide risk, the depression risk, and 30% of that group report having been raped. Six or more ACEs lowers life expectancy for tw by 20 years, so that's, that's critical. If there was any other issue in the health system that you know, highlighted uh, what was going on, we would have intervened a lot sooner. Seven or more ACEs leads to a threefold lung cancer risk and a fourfold risk of heart disease. So they're a predictor of all the issues that we struggle with. And what about this poor little guy? You know, he's wired for stress. He's got attachment problems. He's aggressive, defiant, lacks self-control, and he's really got, he's living on survival mode. He's got limited empathy, can't make friends, lifelong problems with learning, and multiple health issues. So it's going to be pretty difficult for him to be a good parent. So we do seriously need to invest in early childhood. Spend a dollar and save 17, are some of the figures that are quoted in relation to this. And this lack of a satisfactory first thousand days does explain why in New Zealand we have one of the highest rates of youth suicide, why we've got such a high rate of incarceration, and why we're seeing increasing numbers of children and adults with a range of preventable medical, behavioural and mental health issues and also why we're seeing the chronic metabolic-related conditions. We actually, know what we, we actually know what we need to do, and it does need to be a New Zealand-based solution. The first thing I would do is to invest in our workforce, and this has to be a workforce that actually knows how to engage with the population that needs us the most. You know, we've actually got a whole range of services that are not being used. And for me, the key worker to engage with a pregnant mum and a family from the diagnosis of pregnancy, and let's start supporting that pregnancy with best start then rather than when the child's born, then engages with the family, learns to oil the wheels for that family, whatever it is that's happening, and follows that child through at least until school age. And in New Zealand, that's likely to be around whanaora, family start, related activity, and it needs to be community driven. So there's a point now where the Prime Minister's wellbeing strategy will get, and then following on from that, the community, we as a wider community, are going to need to get up and say, well, actually in Rotorua, in my case, uh, there's a whole lot of initiatives that we can grow here that are actually going to link in with that strategy and have government systems then start to align. We can also go for the child, youth and friendly city thinking and then obsess about the first thousand days, but also getting young people who are going to become that next set of parents who need a leg up. And if you actually obsess with those, you start somewhere and actually you end up everywhere. And, uh, and we're going to need to drive that as well. So mata huru huru, karere te manu. You give a bird feathers and the bird will fly. And... We haven't talked about colonisation, racism, the financial systems and the increasing gap between rich and poor in this country and our loss of an egalitarian society. Clearly contributors to all of those ACEs that we talked about earlier. Thanks.